This is Through the Glass. This is our second episode. Um, if you're watching this, thank you. Um, we have yet to be taken off the air, so that's a good thing. If you're seeing this, I want to give a special thanks to Lake House Recording Studios in particular, John Liedersdorf and Juan O'Grady. Thank you guys for letting, uh, letting me do this and uh, being open-minded, as you always are. I appreciate it. Uh, this is our second episode, um, so I'm excited personally to, to continue to do this and to try things out. If you have any questions, comments, praise, or other constructive criticisms, please feel free to uh, reach out to the studio or through this YouTube channel. Uh, I will read everything. Promise. Okay, so today, episode two, we have Renee Maskin. I really appreciate her coming on the show. She is a singer, songwriter, nice person in general, and also the singer and guitarist for Low Light. Renee, hi. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm uh, honored to be guest number two, you know. Oh, well, it's good to have you. Yeah. So it's a big deal to for you to be out and about. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, um, I joke about it, but it's true. I'm a germaphobe on a good day. So, you know, I spent the first couple months of the pandemic, like waking up in the middle of the night going like, oh my God, a pandemic, <laughs> you know? Um, but, you know, in, in sort of a, an attempt to be non-agoraphobic, when you told me there's a lot of precautions in place and, and when I was looking at it, I was like, well, going to the grocery store seems more dangerous than coming here. So I can uh, give give it the old shot, <laughs> come and talk to somebody. Well, thanks for giving it the old shot. Yeah. I got you on that. Uh, yeah. You know, I was when we talked, I told you my wife and I and the kids uh, were on the conservative end as well. So yeah. I feel you on that. Yeah. So you're generally agoraphobic. Not a agor actually not agoraphobic. I am germaphobic. Um, it's always been a little bit of a joke with the band. Um, I was using hand sanitizer before it was cool. <laughs> you know, everyone used to make fun of me, and then suddenly you couldn't find it in the stores anywhere. Because um, you had it all. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't actually. Um, I was looking for it and like having a meltdown. But uh, yeah, I um, I like people a lot but I do walk around with a hand sanitizer. I lived in Brooklyn. That made it better living in the city. Like I had to come to terms with the fact that it'd be in a subway car with a lot of people coughing and sneezing. And I got better about not freaking out about it. But, um, you know, uh, I would walk around with a bottle of hand sanitizer. I can't tell you how many people used to make fun of me for it. You know, I'd be like, listen, you do you. I just like came out of like the disgusting bathroom of the bar we just played. I would like to use some hand sanitizer, you know, but uh, um, but not agoraphobic at all. That you know, I I like people, um, and so this has been a hard year for me because I'm usually out and about. Um, I really like Asbury Park for that reason, in terms of um, being able to go to shows, being able to walk into my house and see people I know, and just stop and chat and the fact that that's kind of gone away this year has been uh been pretty hard you know um but hopefully things will come back and I can walk around and chat with people again and and get back to it you know yeah well we're fortunate to be able to chat you know to be through the glass and do it in a safe way so right. I'm thankful for that so what have you been doing so since it's a rough year you know maybe as you say especially for someone like you mm -hmm. you know you want to be social you were already like eh on the germs. So yeah, what what have you been up to? How you've been productive? I guess creatively. Well, um, I've been learning how to do some um, recording on my own, which is something I've always sort of uh, resisted. Um, I I don't like. I get a little flustered having to run the computer and plug in things and then sit down and try to do a good take and then run over and press. I, I always kind of liked being in the seat and having a partner there to uh, help me with that. I'm also a Luddite, so gear is not my strong suit. I'm just like, I just, I just want something to work. You know, I, I don't want to know how it works. I just want it to work. Um, but this year, uh, getting better at it, um, you know, purchased some gear. And so with Lowlight, I've been recording remotely for them 
And then while I've had this setup going, I was like, you know, I've got all these songs that I've always meant to do uh, as a solo project, but between low light, my day job, keeping the, the bills paid, I've never been able to do it. So that's been a focus this year too. It's like, I can finally make my own records, you know? And it's been a long time coming, I think. You're right about sometimes it could be a drag when you're trying to run the session and perform on the session. Mm -hmm. It's hard enough to get a good take, I think, and just yeah. be in the moment. But then if you're like looking at a uh, a little digital meter, oh, it went into the orange. Shit. Yeah, right. What uh, what are you using to record yourself? How, how do you go about it? Because I know there's a lot of people, many of which will you know check out this podcast and who will you know, be interested in that because they're doing it themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm using Reaper. Um, and the reason I chose it is because it's pretty inexpensive. You can get a free trial and you can run it for a very long time. Um, I have a lot of friends who use Reaper. Uh, Daryl, who's our engineer in low light, um, I gave him a list. I'm like, what should I use? He's like, use Reaper. Uh, if you can't afford Pro Tools, if it's too much, just get that. So I got that. It, it's a little bit of a learning curve. It's a little trickier in some ways than Pro Tools, but um, you know, I can get a nice clean recording out of it. I got a um, uh, David Perlman microphone um, and uh, you know, and the SM57s and all this stuff. And I'm just recording like a maniac, <laughs> so. And the band has done some remote recording and then put it together or is that just for demo and writing purposes like what's the plan um well it's it's actually for the record so they i mean they've got they bought it so the whole thing with low light is that um there's a couple in the band and they purchased a church out in pennsylvania that they've been converting into a studio um but i'm not going out there because of covid so yeah. uh, i was like well what can i do to still participate, but be on my own and do my own thing. So he sent me a list of things um, to pick up. But yeah, it's all for the record. Um, and you know, I'm not great with like plugins and things, but I'm just getting a good clear uh, take and sound. And he's just then running them through his rig over at the church. We do a lot of that at the studio, mm -hmm. reamping stuff that people do at home. As long as, yeah. as long as you get it, it's, and it's not distorted. Right you can kind of run it through anything. Right. So we've been getting a good amount of that stuff at the studio yeah. this year. They bought a church? They bought a church. What's the, st is there a st what's the story behind that? That they, sounds awesome, first of all. Yeah. It, Not good for churches out there. I know they're uh, <laughs> less and less, but... Uh, well, that's, I mean, that's the thing. It's that uh, they found this little town in Pennsylvania where there was more churches than people going to church. So um, these two churches, I guess, were combining and they were selling one of the buildings. And uh, the couple in the band, Daryl and Dana, were like, well, we would like a home that we could renovate into a studio, um, a working studio. So they walked into this church and they're like, well, this seems pretty perfect. The acoustics are right. You know, it's got a, a pipe organ, working pipe organ in tune. Um, yeah, it's a crazy little building that they got going on out there. You haven't so, seen it yet? I, I've seen it. Yeah, I was out there um, before lockdown. And then I was out there for a little bit after lockdown, but when things started kind of getting worse, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go back to Asbury Park um, and be in my own spot, so. Are they living there too? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it's cool though, you know. So I mentioned uh, your band, Low Light. I was listening to the record the last two days, the latest one, Endless Bummer. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of things I'd like to talk about about the record, but mainly, so I've seen you guys play, I think only twice okay. live. And uh, that's where it's at. Yeah. I think you guys have a, a really cool vibe live. There's something going on um, in particular. So you played See Here Now mm -hmm. last year, which was probably amazing. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, to be on a stage that big. But I didn't catch you on that stage. I caught you guys at Tina's tent. Yeah. The art tent because uh, I had to just be running around doing things that day but I'm glad I did it was like super intimate it doesn't get much cooler a tiny art gallery in the middle of a already cool music festival right w what was playing that like you know it was really cool um, it was one of the best shows we've ever played I'll preface it with um, we did a tour with the pretenders so 
it wasn't like it was out of our wheelhouse. When we were on tour with Pretenders, it, all, those big stages felt like they were out of our wheelhouse, uh, and they taught us a lot. So by the time we got to see Here Now, um, we knew what to communicate to the uh, to the to the crew. You know, I was able to say, "We're you know, I work best like this. I do this at certain times." The sound at See Here Now, which is funny because it was an outdoor gig, best sound we've ever had on stage. Um, w impeccable. I could hear everything, um, and I'd never had that before. And you know, we were always joking that outdoor shows, it's hard to get good sound, and it is. You know, um, but we were like, "Holy moly, these guys really know." what they're doing so in that way it was a lot of fun everything sounded good at that festival yeah uh just as a listener i wasn't on any stages but as a listener it was just tight all, all the all the hang-ups you get from outdoor shows mm -hmm. i guess everything's dialed in yeah at this point yeah i don't know who ran the audio for that i forget the company it wasn't a local company no it wasn't asbury audio yeah um but but they knew what they were doing you know um and it was a lot of fun um, and I was I was bummed out for the the bands that were going to be on it this year, but it sounds like, you know, twenty twenty one they'll be able to play, and you know, we'll get it all back again hopefully. Um, how did the how did the band how did the band get together? What's the what's the low light uh, genesis story? Um, well, okay, so where to begin? The uh, the band got together. Me and the drummer have known each other since we were five. And we've been playing on and off since high school, but uh, when I was in college, we, me and the drummer were playing in this prog rock band um, for a long time. I was in that prog rock band for about 10 years. I think he was in it for about five or six. Um, and uh, went to Ramapo College. I was not very social, I was very shy. And I would sit in music classes with a bunch of people, one of whom happened to be Daryl, uh, our guitar player. And so after college, um, I was just kind of hanging out. I moved to Brooklyn and I was hanging out with a mutual friend and I was like, I'd like to just record some stuff. And he's like, why don't we go to Daryl's house? He's got a, actually he had a recording studio in New York at the time, but um, so I just, I, I, you know, it was a kid that I'd always sat in with class and I knew we were like the two kind of cool, quirky, quiet kids in, at Ramapo, but we never actually spoke because we didn't speak to anybody, you know? Um, and then so, uh, yeah, and I started uh, making music with Daryl, with him recording it, and then his wife Dana, now wife Dana, uh, would hop on and, and play some stuff. So eventually, I was like, why don't we just start a band? And I got Colin in. Um, in the beginning, they had a friend, Tony Eichel, who's just a fantastic guitar player, lap steel, pedal steel player. Um, he was in it in the beginning. He moved down to Nashville, which is where he should be, and he's kind of killing it down there as a uh, session musician. But um, And then we got Ray, who's been a friend of me and Collins for a very long time. Got him in, and here we are, Lily. You know? So it seems like a really cohesive unit. The one thing on the record that jumps out, I mean, the first thing that jumps out is your voice. You've well, got a yeah. great voice. Thank it's, you. It's, it's very commanding, but not in a... Uh, aggressive kind of way it sort of lulls you in it's a it's a great voice so well, you know kudos to your <laughs> genetics and <laughs> well I, I don't know how this happened <laughs> it, no it's killer but the other thing that jumps out is uh the drumming jumped out at me i really like how there's sort of the syncopated thing going on on a lot of on a lot of the songs i think it adds a lot of energy sometimes it adds some anxiety Mm -hmm. too and I really dug that I, I always tend to hone in on rhythm sections always have I think that's where it's at in, in a lot of bands um, even though I play guitar I care less about it half the time right you know but so is that a is that something that has to do with your guys relationship you said you've been friends since you were five yeah we've known each other since we were and we grew up around the corner from each other he used to beat up my twin brother a lot <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, well, I mean, what's funny, um, my two thoughts on that, when we were talking about Rick Rubin's podcast, and you were talking about the Jeff Tweedy episode. Yeah, yeah. And he says something about how he's not a technical singer, but sometimes if you're not very technical, you get, I forget what exactly what he said, but a, a certain amount of honesty out of your voice if you're not a super technical singer. And I think that's where my voice lives. I know I have a cool voice. I'm never going to be able to sing like, 
some of the other people in town, some of the other people who come here to the Lake House studios. Um, but I think there's a realness in my voice that I think uh, conveys itself. Uh, Colin is just a drummer's drummer, man. That kid can just, he's not a kid, he's my age, but like he can just play, man. You know, he's really talented. He's got a finesse, which is so interesting because I've never played with a drummer who's hit the drums harder than him. I don't know how you hit the drums that hard and play with finesse. It's just wild to me. Like he is just a drummer um, and just so very talented. And, you know, it's, it's been fun and interesting, the fact that we've been friends for so long and have played on so many projects together, you know. Well, that's interesting because I think there's definitely a chemistry there. So, yeah, there was some, something about the rhythm, especially in the first half of the record. It, it, it just adds, I don't know, just added a lot of energy, and mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, prog rock? Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I would say low light's probably the, the opposite of well, progressive rock. It's funny, it's kind of getting back more towards that. Um, me and Colin played in a prog rock band, and Daryl and Dana um, played in a different prog rock band before we all met each other. Um, they played in a band called Tsunami, um, which played Asbury a bunch of times. And they, they, would, they toured like Taiwan. Their, their main guy was um, a Taiwanese guy uh, who played the air who, which is a violin kind of thing. And they, they toured Taiwan and China and stuff doing prog rock. Uh, and so it's funny when we came together, I was so sick of playing prog rock. <laughs> I was just like, I just want to play songs that I can have actual fun playing and I don't have to think about everything for 40 <laughs> minutes. I can have a fucking drink and just play, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And so we started off more on the country bent. The more we go, I think the more our ambition, uh, just generally, uh, rears its head and so the music's become more complicated even endless bummer you know for every kind of countryish kind of thing there's sort of hidden um, complexities they keep sort of coming out coming out you know what are some of the progressive bands that influenced you and and them um, so I always shied away from progressive rock it it maybe because it felt unattainable mm -hmm. it's like too much it's like that's too cool yeah <laughs> like it was interesting and yeah. But it felt unattainable, I guess, as an aspiring wannabe artist. Mm -hmm. So so maybe I, I didn't give it a fair shake because was, I was intimidated by it. So who who were some of the artists in that world? Well, to be completely frank, um, I was in the prog band for 10 years, but I myself was never super prog. I was always in the David Bowie, Brian Eno camp, Talking Heads camp. Like, I always liked weird stuff. So these kids were making this weird... And when I said that I was in a prog band, the closest thing I could describe the sound to, if you could take King Crimson and Devo and <laughs> shove them together, put a little Sid Barrett in there too, for good measure, and that's what the band sounded like. So it wasn't pure like, um, what's it, Porcupine Tree or something? It wasn't like pure prog. Um, and I always, I just came, I was a hard David Bowie fan growing up. So just to, just to play with a bunch of weirdos, just doing weird music to me was very appealing. <laughs> so there's a Devo. I don't know if it's a documentary. It's really just like a collection of all the videos mm -hmm. and kind of infomercials. And I don't, I don't know. It was the <laughs> one of, it's so freaking out there. It was on Amazon prime or something like, Ooh, a Devo documentary. <laughs> but it wasn't really a proper documentary. Yeah. They're so far out. You realize yeah. like, you know, I guess their biggest song was like Whip It. Mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing that video probably when it came out and I was just like, what? Meanwhile, that's like one of the most normal, tame right. things that they did. It, it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I was just watching, um, it, I'm, I'm only making the association. I was just watching a documentary about a bunch of weirdos. Uh, the uh, Captain Beefheart documentary. I saw it on YouTube. I yeah. love Captain yeah. B5. Uh, Ice Cream for Crow is yeah. one of my favorite records. I play it. I played for my kids. They think it's like they don't even know what to make of it. Yeah, we love Captain B. Yeah. in Yeah, house. No, I was watching the document. My friend was like, you, "Just watch, the, watch this documentary." Um, you know, it's so funny watching like Ry Cooter, who's who's such like a seems like a very calm, down to earth guy. Just going like, "Yeah, he's like locked us in the house. We weren't allowed to leave." 
<laughs> you know. There's um, a lot of weird stories about yeah. Beefheart, you know, yeah. really being like psychologically and physically abusive right. uh, to the musicians. Even look at some of the artwork and the albums and you could tell it's like, right. oh, those, <laughs> o- those other guys, they're not having a good day. No. <laughs> um, you're really just sort of at the whim of someone's uh, pure creativity. You know, I, I think they were not a lot for some songs not wearing monitors or not mm-hmm. listening to the music while they were recording to it it's like right. just do a solo right but there's no you know you're just doing a solo out right. in the ether alone and then you put it in and then read poetry over it yeah and uh yeah trout mask replica yeah. but <laughs> ice cream for crow is my favorite yeah i think i saw the documentary you're talking about it, it kind of starts really with more of his blues mm-hmm. beginnings and and really trying to cop uh who is the singer? Howlin' Wolf? With yeah. that voice. Yeah, blah, Howlin' blah, Wolf. Blah, you yeah. know, because that kind of remained his voice. Right. Except he took it into the avant-garde of poetry. Right. Whatever whatever that band is. If you're out right. there, you guys, you should seriously check out Captain Beefheart. Yeah. And uh, my friend Mark Prescott, what's up, Mark? He, he turned me on to them and he said, it's the first music that ever made me scared. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I had to reason. listen to it. And then you pop on the record. You're like, whoa, <laughs> what yeah, the like, fuck what? is going on? Yeah. Well, and it's funny. I am um, more. Th- I like Captain Beefheart, but I'm a huge Tom Waits fan. But, you know, you just listen to Beefheart and then you listen to the later Tom Waits and you can just see where he was just like pulling all of that out. You know, Tom had the voice for it, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. But then before his wife, Kathleen, introduced him to Beefheart, he was doing more of a you know, uh, I'm semi-homeless beatnik poet thing. And then he got into Beefheart and you can just tell the shift, you know. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a direct line there? Has Yeah. I think they've even talked about it. Like I read interviews, like Beefheart. He went, he went, that helped him start to think more sonically, like banging two by fours against the wall as opposed to you know, the record company wants us to bring an orchestra into the studio. Like, he started kind of going elsewhere. And then you can, you know, even, like, getting Rabot, you know, Mark Rabot to play the way that Rabot plays with Tom Waits specifically. I feel like that could be a line from B Part too. Like, you know, don't play it like it's supposed to sound, you know, right in the, you know, melodic pocket. Play it a little dirty, you know, play it. I think Tom Waits, one of his quotes is, play it like your hair is on fire. You know, interpret that. (laughs) (laughs) His music's cool. I I never got to see him. Have you ever seen him perform? I saw him once, uh, but it wasn't an actual concert. I had a friend who worked for um, Jimmy Fallon's late night show, and Tom was coming on. She's like, I got you a ticket. Uh, She knew what a fan I was. And so me and Colin, the drummer, uh, we went and we went to see Tom Waits uh, at Jimmy Fallon. You know, how was that? It was awesome. It was so good. Um, yeah, it was just nice to be in us because the, the studio is pretty small. So we only played one song, but it was nice to be in such a small room with somebody I admire so much, you know, and it, the roots were all like, oh, shit, Tom Waits, you know, um, it, it was it was fun. Um, yeah. It's cool. What do they do for those shows? They they just do. Is it just one song? What do they get two two takes at it, and then whatever one's the better one is what gets aired. How, how does that work? Yeah, one song. Um, I've been to a lot of late night tapings. I was more of a Conan head when I was in college. I'd go there all the time. Um, one song you could get. Some people took one take. A lot of people would take two. Um, so, yeah, that's how that goes. What are some of the top late night performances? <laughs> oh God. Well. Um, Conan had everybody. Conan did have everybody. I, I'm trying to remember if it was the first one I went to. I think it was. Uh, Lamb Chop is a band that I've grown to love, and I'd never heard of them before. And I go to a Conan taping because I was such a Conan fan, and I'm sitting in the audience, and uh, this weird band comes on, and they're called Lamb Chop, and they just played this this weird-looking band playing this weird, quiet, strange music and I just remember sitting there going like what am I looking at I don't even know what this is but that of course is like an instant doorway for me to go and research it later on you know like 
the things that I don't understand are the things that sort of stick in my head. I, like, I, I gotta go and figure out what that was. <laughs> and they've turned out to be one of my favorite bands. I'll have to show. check them out. Lamb cool. Chop. Mm -hmm. All over the place. They start out, he, the guy, the main dude started out like doing like weird country. And then at some point he started playing weird quiet jazz. And then he moved into weird electronic music. Um, they just put out an EP a couple months ago that's back into the weird country genre, but it's a bunch of covers. Um, they would do a Wilco cover. They do a couple of things. Good band. Just a strange guy. Strange guy, weird voice, interesting lyrics. It's like all the things that I love. Young Lamb Chop, Tom Waits, David Bowie. Weirdos doing weird things. <laughs> and it doesn't get any weirder than Beef Heart. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> so for everyone out there, if you want to go all the way to the end. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's things further, but I guess that, that was actually signed to a label and was like a touring thing. And, uh, and picture yourself being a session musician, being locked in a house with this guy, uh, getting um, <laughs> worn down physically <laughs> and psychologically. <laughs> Yeah, I think he had some heavy hitters on those records too. Gary yeah. Lucas, mm -hmm. a few other people, heavy hitters, but I guess he was a heavy hitter too. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that documentary was funny because uh, one of the things in the beginning that someone was saying to, I think, Ry Cooter, like, oh, this guy's going to be as big as the Beatles. <laughs> And then you could see where that went. <laughs> like, you know, they were thought this guy was going to be like the next Sergeant Peppers, and I suppose in some way he was, but it wasn't the uh, the hot pop take that anyone thought it was going to be. I suppose he's a painter as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've checked out some of his paintings. There was a minute where I was like, maybe I should invest in artwork yeah. and like sell something that I have. It's like you know, sell a, sell a bunch of things that are I think are expensive to buy one thing that I think will grow like art right and uh first takeaway was that i can't afford any of it <laughs> but um some really beautiful pieces mm -hmm. what's his name van fleet uh, yeah Van felt and flit something <laughs> like that um, but really beautiful oil yeah oil paintings mm -hmm. i think maybe some acrylic um have you ever painted uh god i'm a terrible painter i was an art major um, but I never got into painting. I'm, I'm a pretty good drafts person. Um, I do graphic design for the day job. So I've got a visual sense, but I was never good with paint. Um, or I should say I, I was too impatient. I liked drawing because drawing was more immediate. Um, and I even like, um, I got into Photoshop when I was a kid because that's pretty immediate. You can start collaging things pretty quickly. Like paint, I'm like, I gotta mix this. Kind of the same way with recording. Oh, I got to set all this stuff up. You know, I, I kind of want immediacy. Um, yeah, but I, I, I draw. I do, I do things like that uh, on, the, on the side a little bit, you know. So. What do you got going on with um, solo work? So I, I, I know the band, obviously, you're setting up a recording studio in a <laughs> church, and you're, you're flying in some files. So mm -hmm. you've started pre-production on the new record. Yeah, well, the new Low Light record is almost, I would say, I don't want to give a percentage, but it's it's more close to done than not done. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. A lot of mixing, though. You know, it's every time we record, we say we're not going to over track. And then, you know, there's like 35, 40 tracks on every, on every song. That's um, just a truth. Yeah. A studio truth. Yeah. Everyone who calls me. So I manage the recording studio. So I'm usually the first person that people talk to. And, and inevitably, it's always just just want to do this real quick thing. I want to do this quick thing. It should only take eh, X amount of time. And it, it's usually one of my first conversations is, of course, asking questions and seeing what what does the goal look like and sound like. It's never a quick thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes it is, but it, it's... It's never a quick thing when, when you're dealing with uh, creativity, and especially if you want to put it out there for ever. Right. You know, I mean, any you can play a show on your couch, you can live stream from your phone and, you know, and fuck up all you want. But if you're going to put something down on record, you, if you have the time, why not make it exactly the way you have it in your mind and experiment right. along the way? I mean, a lot of albums work as live records, 
and that's beautiful. And most of those aren't even live. You right. know, there's all sorts of overdubbing that goes on and tuning. But if you can bug out, why not bug out? Right. Where do you guys Where do you guys tend to bug out track wise? Like, what instruments? What ideas? Um, a lot of drums, a lot of percussion. A lot yeah, of I could hear the percussion boards. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, Colin really shines with that kind of stuff too. He um, he has an interesting approach and a, an interesting ear for little percussive pockets and things. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of drums and keyboards tends to be the thing, um, is the main thing, yeah. And what about, uh, so we talked a little bit earlier and on the phone, you're doing some solo stuff. What, uh, what makes it not a low light song and what makes it a Renee song and, and, and what's the difference? Um, well, you know, sometimes they, they can fluctuate. Like I, one of our first songs is a song called Bones uh, that I wrote. And when I was first starting to get together with Low Light as our unit, they were like, you know, we really like this song. We would like to do it. They interpreted it different than the way I play it. Um, uh, so some of them kind of, uh, they can go from one to the other. But some things I just write and I just know that what I'm hearing is not what Low Light's going to do with it, which is fine, you know, because they're tremendous musicians. Um, I kind of know where they're going to take it, but sometimes I'm like, I, I need this to be quiet, I need this to be a certain thing, and I don't think it's going to translate well through the filter of the other four people in the band. Um, th they could take it and interpret it into something else that would be really awesome, but in terms of, like, you know, th there are certain songs that I would like to keep on more of a like a Bill Callahan, like Will Oldham, like weird but acoustic-y, quiet -y kind of stuff that I know that it's harder for Low Light to do when you have a tremendous drummer, when you have a keyboardist who's got all these crazy cool synthesizers. It's just hard to keep it low-key. Well, nobody, nobody wants to not put their stamp. Right. It's yeah. a natural thing. I love Will Oldham, by the way. Yeah. Big fan of that music. Yeah, yeah. Is he still doing things? I feel oh, like yeah. I haven't listened... I forget who turned me on to him, but it was years and years ago, and I kind of forgot about him, so thanks for the reminder on yeah. that. What's he doing? Um, he's been, well, him and Bill Callahan have been putting out a lot of covers on Spotify right now. Um, he's been making a lot of records over the past few years, but they've been a lot of cover records, so like he's kind of diving into weird stuff. The last show I saw before lockdown, it was the weekends before everything shut down, was uh, uh, Bonnie Prince Billy and Jonathan Richmond. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, I got to meet Jonathan, which was cool. And he was a super nice, super, super nice guy. A little, you know, as, as quirky and as uh, interesting as you'd want him to be, but also just very genuinely nice. And uh, that was a really great memory, a wonderful show. And then everything shut down. <laughs> so You yeah. mentioned them doing cover albums. I, I did not see like the cover thing, mm -hmm. or the tribute thing becoming such a thing as yeah. it has in the past few years. I feel like when I was coming up, like you were definitely like, nobody was happy if you were like doing a cover song, even if it was like during sound check, it, right. like, it was not okay. You yeah. were gonna get like heckled. Right. And I can't wrap my head around. I think it's super cool, by the way, because when I'm home and I'm sitting on the couch, I'm always playing cover songs. I mm -hmm. never play songs that I've written. Right. And I've dabbled in and out of the, you know, like pub and brewery scene just playing songs and eighty percent of what I was playing were cover songs, but and I never occurred to me to, to put out proper mm -hmm. cover songs and it appears to be a huge thing. I can't wrap my mind around it. How did this happen? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I'm I've been thinking the same thing. I think in terms of Will Oldham, I think he's just doing him. And some of his cover records, I mean, the things he's covering are so obscure that it doesn't matter. He's just kind of doing him. I did notice, though, um, that Spotify seems to be pushing a lot of cover songs to the top of the algorithms, you know. So I'm, I wonder if it's that a little bit. Or is everybody just trying to fight to get to the top of that algorithm? Like, oh, they're liking covers. I'm going to do a cover. I don't know. It's a good question. It's, it's interesting because they fall into two camps. It's like you could take a song and and really 
redo it, mm -hmm. reimagine it, I guess would be right. a good word. Or you can just like do that song. Right. And to do the song, it's like, I think people would be better off maybe finding the artist that uh, did it originally and giving them a couple spins right. and maybe a couple, a couple pennies yeah. in their account. So yeah, I just, I can't wrap my mind around it, but it, it is cool when artists really go far out there mm -hmm. um, where you're, you don't notice it until like the hook. Right. Like, oh shit. It almost, yeah. you know who does that? Like with his own music, Bob Dylan. Yeah. I've seen him like a bunch of times. Yeah. You don't, it could be like blowing in the wind and you don't even know it's blowing in the wind. Right. Until like, you, until, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you catch the one lyric. You're like, oh, that's what he's playing. <laughs> I think he said in the wind. <laughs> But he's, I guess, like the ultimate example. Yeah. And his band is so killer. Oh, my God. Yeah. It seems like every time they go out, well, they're always on tour. Don't they call it like the forever? Yeah, yeah the endless tour. The endless tour or whatever. But they, depending on the night, I'm sure depending on the material they're doing too, but they just do different styles. Yeah. So I've seen them in concert and it was like a Zydeco kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. I've seen them you know, just slow blues vibe. I've seen them do like rocking hard, almost like punk, right. punky right. kind of thing. And the band can just like seamlessly go through these things. I, I assume it's the only way to keep it interesting, but uh, it blows my mind yeah. that they can do that. And it's, I'm sure it's not prepped. Like yeah. I have this image of him just like emerging for the show and then just like disappearing into the ether. We tried to sneak onto his tour bus once. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my buddy Mark and I, we went to the State Theater. This oh, was nice. the State Theater to yeah. see him. And we had the last two seats in the place and it's very high up. It's a gorgeous theater. Mm -hmm. It's like exactly how, you, you know, like the, the high balconies or the very vertical mm -hmm. type balconies. It's not like on an angle. And they were the two last seats and I, I get all the credit to Mark. He goes, I have an idea. Just go along with it. <laughs> he said, okay. So we, we walked out. We saw a security person. He said, excuse me, I need to speak with the head of security. And they said, oh, uh, okay. He's actually right over there. So my friend Mark went over. We had nothing in our hands, not a camera or even a pencil. And he's like, we're filming a documentary. And, you know, we... It would just be great if we could just be a little bit closer to the stage and and we'd be happy to, you know, put you in the credits like as a thank you. Oh, and no. the guy was like, no problem. And he brought us right to the front of the stage. We were in the first row oh my God. <laughs> for the show. And then we got, you know, we got cocky. And so we leave the show. We're all like, that was amazing. And he was that kind of guy anyway. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty good at going along. Right. So he's like, we're getting on the bus. So the way the buses were staggered, it was like security, buses, and then like another security, and then like one last bus. Yeah. We got all the way to the last bus. Oh, man. And then we were physically, uh, physically removed. <laughs> and, and the guy's like, how did you, how did you get here? And we're like, we told him like what we did. So he was kind of fascinated. You could tell he was more pissed at yeah. his crew <laughs> yeah, for laying right. these two idiots, clearly just these young dudes drinking beer all day. Like, yeah, we're filming a documentary. No camera. <laughs> not, I figured at least like maybe a pencil and a notebook would have made sense. Yeah. So sorry, security team at the State Theater <laughs> and Bob Dylan's tour. Um, the band was so killer yeah. to be up that close and to hear the, the amps. Yeah not so much the PA sound. I was on we were, uh, stage, in front of stage left, so Bob was stage right at his, uh, at his organ, just hunched over it like a, like a cowboy, just yeah. badass. So we're, I was in front of, I forget his main guitar player, fellow who plays with a lot of different things. I'm so bad with names. They all just disappear. It was just mind. so good. Yeah. Was like, Man. Yeah. His band is killer. Yeah, no. Um, I saw him when he was doing his... Uh, Frank Sinatra covers, you know, oh, yeah. which was awesome. It you know, um, and then I saw him the next year, and he was going back to his own original material, and it was nice to see both things, because um, the the that sort of American standard tour 
it felt very like David Lynch Twin Peaks, like the lighting was weird and he was being weird. The whole thing was weird, but I enjoyed it very much. And then to see him the next year, very energized again, back on his original material, like you could feel the energy. And I actually went to that show. I went to both shows with a guy who has seen Bob Dylan over 365 times. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so when we were at both shows, and with the the one we saw, he was like, "This is the best I've seen him in years." He's clearly like into it. He yeah. should try the uh, shooting a documentary line. I know. <laughs> for his uh, to commemorate his three hundred and sixty sixth. Well, show. <laughs> Bob used to know who he was. He's got some funny stories because he went to so many shows that there was one because Bob doesn't allow photos, and he was like this guy. My friend Steve was down near the stage and someone near Steve was taking photos and apparently he had seen Bob like Bob had said hi to him a couple times because he, all right this guy has seen me a lot I see this guy at like every show so Bob says to Steve like hey man get this guy to stop taking pictures and Steve is not like a you know like a security guard type person he was just like oh, I don't know what you want me to do man <laughs> you know like it was just like a, it, hearing Steve tell this story it must have been a really funny like Bob Dylan's asking you to tell this guy to stop taking pictures. And he's just like, <laughs> I don't know how to handle this. I think you just got to make it work. If Bob Dylan like looks at you and asks you to yeah. do something. Yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Every time I've seen him, he just, he walks out, doesn't look at anyone, yeah. sits down or, you know, whatever he's, his posture is yeah. that night. Yeah. Staring at the microphone, burns through the songs and just walks off. Right. Yeah. Doesn't look at anyone. I, I, I mean, who knows what it's like to be a, an icon for I don't know over 40 years yeah 50 years yeah. it was like mid 60s he started doing his thing and he yeah. became hot right right away when he showed up in New York and doing that scene at cafes and, and the folk scene oh my gosh yeah, yeah I can't do math but certainly at least 50 plus years I don't know what that's like to be iconic for that long it's gotta be scary it's got to be weird. And, I, you know, and I think, like, I, I was watching a documentary about him, and it was filmed in the 80s. And he was, like, in Canada, and somebody in Canada, like, touched his nose. And we're like, oh, your nose is, that's your real nose. And he was like, what? <laughs> you know, I think when you're that famous, people stop. You, you kind of turn into, like, a cartoon character. You're like, you know, Donald Duck walking around in Disney World. You know, like, people think that they can just come up to you and say things to you and be weird to you, but you're still a person. You're not. You're not Donald Duck at Disney World. You're not wearing a costume. You're you. You know. Um, I think that's got to be hard on anybody. But he just sold his whole catalog for three hundred million dollars. So, like, he sold his publishing. Yeah, which makes me wonder if he's going to tour again. You know, that might be the retirement plan. But yeah, he just he just stole, sold 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 all of his music. In a really like the biggest music rights selling deal to Universal, huh? Um, yeah, three hundred million. I think so. A billion, something ridiculous. Um, some number that I couldn't even comprehend. Like, what do you do with all that money? Uh, but probably, I don't know. Secure your assets. And, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you could buy a Captain Beefheart painting or two. Yeah, or two. <laughs> I think that would work. So, oh my gosh. Yeah. So you saw the standards tour, so. Yeah. What, what was like, was he, cr was he trying, because if anyone has seen Bob Dylan perform, you know, you, you could be getting anything yeah. uh, vocally. It could be like really velvety and gorgeous, or it could just be like, kind of like a weird choked bark. Yeah. <laughs> and it's all good. Yeah. I've seen all of those things and they're all good. So was he trying to croon? Yeah. And he was good at it. You know, he was hitting the notes because uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. And sometimes I wonder if he's putting it on like that big growly thing that, you know, out of tune growl that he does all the time that drives people a little nuts. I'm kind of like Tom Waits does that, too. But Tom Waits knows that he's doing it. I think people have this <clears throat> assumption that Bob Dylan doesn't know that he's doing it. I think he does because <laughs> when I saw him he was like in key and, and singing and it sounds good and even those records he sounds totally in key I think Bob just does Bob if he wants to sound all growly and out of tune he does and if he wants to be on the mark he's on the mark and well you know as a singer too it's like sometimes you have to take care of your voice and that guy's been doing 
he's toured every year forever. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess there's some nights where you know you just got to take it easy, and then you got to have the choked bark. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like he's like just like yelling orders at people. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I think. What do you do? Speaking of taking care of your voice, we get a lot of singers, obviously, mm -hmm. in the studio. And, and one of the things that surprises people is, like, you know, getting your voice in shape, mm -hmm. not just for a show, but especially for a recording. And, and, and amateurs and people just starting out, they don't have a grasp on that. I didn't when I started singing. It took, you know, doing those pub shows three, mm -hmm. four hours and then crapping out after two hours right. and having it sound, well, probably like, bad Bob Dylan Yeah. <laughs> to learn, oh, there's exercises, oh, there's things to drink or not drink. Right. Do you have, do you have uh, rituals for your voice? So how do you take care of it? I don't, I don't really, I mean, I will, uh, this is what I'm saying. Like I don't, when I, when people talk to me about being a singer, I'm, I don't really feel like a singer. Um, there's things I do and I don't do. I actually find that I, I have to warm up a lot when I sing a lot to be honest with you, my voice gets better. If it's the, yeah, I'm, if I rest my voice too much and then I get all froggy and weird and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I'm not, I wish I had uh, practical advice for someone who actually wants to be a singer. I just kind of do me a little bit. Well, but when I'm, you were touring with the Pretenders, was that the heaviest um, gig schedule that you had had up to that point? Um, no. Uh, you know, we, it was a short tour, and we were playing every night, and I was going for it pretty hard every night. But I never lost my voice, um, and I pushed it pretty hard. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, you know, knock on the, it's not wood. It's like a pressed <laughs> material. Knocked on pressed material next to me. I, you know, I haven't hurt my voice ever. Um, but, again, I sort of mostly sing within my range I'm not I do yell when I get like really into it but I'm not like screaming all show long you know it, it's not um, I'm more in the crooner aspect of, of a singer's voice than I am in, in something else you know I don't feel so much volume notwithstanding I don't feel so different speaking to you than if I were singing right now that know? comes across on, on the albums too and spe speaking of the album, you guys recently were recognized by the Asbury Park Press. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that? I don't want to get the details wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's a, uh, you know, we, we couldn't play too many shows this year. So it was nice that the Asbury Park Press um, put a list of the 14 songs that they thought were the best, quote unquote, with um, a certain criteria of they thought that it was like uh, a little asterisks like important or whatever for relevant which is not a word I love either but like they just th there was criteria for why they picked the songs and then one of our songs got into it which was cool and um it was a remix of our song Horsefoot which the the chorus is I need room to move so I guess that was very sort of pandemic when we were all sort of quarantined and couldn't go anywhere it resonated with a lot of people relevant and, yeah <laughs> relevant and then uh um you know, and uh, our bass player, Ray, was really instrumental in um, arranging the remix of that. He he does um, work with his MPC. He was a DJ before he came into the band. He actually wasn't even a bass player. Yeah, I got that when I saw you guys. He was he was futzing around with some electronics, too, just adding a lot of layers yeah. to the live sound. Yeah. It seemed like, yeah, he kind of came from that because he, he had a strong yeah. handle on it. We More of a handle than on the bass. Well, he's a tremendous bass player. You know, the reason I trusted to ask him to play bass, even though he was not a bass player, I've seen that guy play every instrument and he's good at it. Yeah. He's one of those guys. Like, I've seen him sit down at a piano and play, like, something beautiful. And I'm like, I didn't even know you knew how to do that. He had a band called Invisible College where he was scratching and playing the guitar and he had this whole band behind him. Um, you know, and I've seen him play drums and he's good at the drums. Like, he's just one of these musical guys like everything you give him he can do um so i had no doubt that he could play the bass but as we sort of progressed as a band he kind of wanted to bring because he's from hip-hop and he's kind of yeah. like i want to bring this stuff that i actually do more into low light so so that's kind of where we've been as a band 
Will there be more of that on the new record? Yeah, the new record is mostly um, tracks that he sent uh, to begin with, um, samples and things that he was cooking up. Um, and actually, Horsefoot is what started it. Um, we kind of really liked the remix, and then he just kind of went nuts uh, and started sending us samples. Um, and then the idea came, like, why don't we work with these and see what happens? So so that's what the new record's really going to be more of. That's cool. So you're getting to stretch out yeah. uh, sonically, like more so like you did back in the day in the, uh, the prog. The prog stuff, yeah. I like the opposite of that too, and I know you've got an acoustic guitar in there. Yeah. Would you Would you play us a song? Sure, I can play you a song. What uh, What do you want to play? Um, it's a good question. Well, what do we got? Um, I'll try. Uh, this is a song that's going to be on the new Low Light record, but it doesn't sound anything like this. Uh, it's called Blood, and um, I wrote it. I woke up in the middle of the night because uh, COVID pandemic, uh, you know, structure has not been something I've been able to keep very well. My sleep's all over the place and all these things. And I woke up in the middle of the night one night and I just could not get back to sleep. And so I picked up a guitar and I wrote this. And then I gave it to Ray and it does not sound like this on the record, but this is a song I wrote at four o'clock in the morning. Blood. Blood. Give me love. <laughs> Give me blood. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for playing that. Yeah, no, this is a beautiful guitar too. You were not wrong when you when you asked me which guitar I'd like to play, and you said this is a great one. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming on. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, it was nice talking with you. Yeah. It was nice getting to know you a little bit in, yeah. in our last two conversations too, because we had never spoken before. Right. Just kind of, I just kind of like you know, 
busted out a DM out of nowhere and you called me on the phone, which no one ever does. So I love that. I'm like, you called me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hey, I mean, you know, I was used to, I, I like I said, not agoraphobic. I really do like people. So it's funny when you were like, hey, I have this idea. Can you, you know, we want to talk about it. I was like, yeah, this feels like what I normally like to do. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you, know? you making it happen. Yeah, thank you. Um, Renee Maskin, solo work maybe soon. Uh, definitely a new low light album very soon. Thanks for coming on Through the Glass. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. All right. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>